One afternoon I was kneeling in the church. A door opened and closed behind me. A somebody I did not see came in. What struck me was that the sense of presence was significantly more and other than just someone else. At the time I was still slowly navigating my way from the outermost edge of the monastery and so did not know who this was save that he was a monk. I had already glimpsed him on odd occasions as I made my way to work at the back of the farm on the other side of the river that ran right through our property. He would often be standing beside our pathway and usually exchanged a few quiet words with Father Basil. As time went by, more and more faces came into focus for me and names were attached. This mystery monk who had aroused my curiosity was Father Morris, the hermit. A Cenobite is a contemplative who lives in a community. A hermit is a contemplative who lives alone. Although strictly speaking Trappists are Cenobites, there is provision for seniors to live as hermits within their monastery's precincts. Early in his contemplative career, Thomas Merton became famous for his spiritual autobiography. However, later in his life, he became equally well known for his struggle to be permitted to live as a hermit. He succeeded, and observed later that he had not gone away into greater solitude to seek God. He believed that a hermitage would be the place where God could find him. Father Morris lived near the river in a primitive little cottage. It was well hidden down behind a very steep bank. This place was treeless and austere. I'm surprised it did not freeze to death during the winter. Occasionally I saw the abbot loping across the fields, obviously heading to the hermitage to care for his son. Now and again the hermit quietly slipped back into our midst for a few days, for reasons a novice was deservedly not privy to. I think that somehow or other I intuited his importance, not as some kind of poetical romantic figure, but a constant blunt reminder of why Southern Star Abbey existed at all. Father Morris was living out on the farthest reach of the contemplative vocation. He lived to pray at the end of the road, along which the rest of us were supposed to be advancing. As in every way of life, it is possible in our spiritual journey too to find a comfortable plateau with a view and camp there. Of course, we are full of the very best intentions to get up and get going again, just as soon as we've had a rest. The tiny fibrolite hermitage sat like Isaiah the prophet's flagstaff on a mountain top. It was a terrible reproach to those who might be hiding from their own vocation, a profound encouragement to all who felt utterly devoid of strength and yet continued to be haunted by the enigmatic allure into the desert. Through the kindness of Father Benedict, I did once follow the abbot's path down Copua Road, past the red cabin where the monastery's pioneers camped in extraordinarily close quarters, over a couple of fences and down the steep incline to the hermitage. My afternoon with the hermit was a confrontation with divine paradox. Unhealthy illusions were gently broken spiritual bedrock uncovered. As the chilly autumn wind off the Ruahinis began to snarl around our shelter, Father Morris seemed to both diminish and become substantial the more we talked. I was nervous and disconcerted to hear a senior speak so unabashedly and eloquently about his own sense of insignificance, self-doubt and even desolation. His rough, cracking voice and the poverty of his accommodation added poignancy to the scene which I can only describe as beautiful. I was surprised that he listened so intently 
and actually seemed to be interested in my half-baked answers to his animated inquiries. I realized that he might have seemed to others a broken man, like a sailing ship driven onto rocks and pounded by a ferocious storm. What I saw was someone like an old fireplace, with blackened bricks and a buckling iron grate. But in this hearth's heart was a fire that was skin blisteringly hot. As I said goodbye, I asked for his blessing and knelt down upon the muddy piece of sacking on the hut's doorstep. His voice and hands were rough and heavy, but the grace of God flowed, fluid, tangible, eternal. When I'd climbed back up the bank to head for home, I stopped and turned for one last look. The hermit had disappeared. The wind blew. The river flowed. All were swallowed up in the falling darkness. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The burning sand will become a pool and the thirsty ground bubbling springs. And a highway will be there. It will be called the Way of Holiness.